Hi everyone, uh, welcome to our recorded video with CEO of Stochastic APS and New Sitala Associates, Dr. Graham Keith. Um, now Graham, as you can see here, not only has a fantastic bookshelf, um, but also <laughs> excels in being able to make sense of risk through numbers. Um, yes, Graham is one of those rare people who actually has the ability to make sure that quantitative risk analysis is both practical and easily accessible to a range of incredibly complex different environments. Um, now, Graham, prior to becoming a consultant, I believe that you were director and lead strategy advisor um, and head of enterprise risk management for Maersk Oil, is that correct? That's correct, yes. Yep, based in Copenhagen, so we're all very jealous of you being based there. Um, and um, that is where, I guess, you, you hone some of those techniques, et cetera, that we're gonna explore in more detail today, is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Uh, it's interesting, the, the lead strategy and, and risk management, that's a little bit of a, a theme that I talk about a lot on, on what I publish online and, and in interviews like this, is the sort of um, relationship between risk management and strategy. And, and actually, I've argued a number of times that strategy and risk management are essentially the same thing. And I, I think we'll come back to that in the course of the conversation today. Yeah, no, certainly. I guess if you want a, a relatively cheap strategy consultant, then you get a risk manager in. Is that the case? <laughs> <laughs> mm, maybe we're not charging enough. No, I didn't say <laughs> okay, so moving, moving swiftly on. Swiftly so, on yes. so just to start with a, with an easy question. So why for yourself? So why risk management? Uh, why do you think it's useful? Um, and what value can it truly bring to an organisation? Apart from, of course, being a, an easy strategy department. <laughs> That's an easy question. Uh, I don't think what the hard questions are. Uh, right risk management. Actually, um, I think the question is not so much why risk management. I think the question is uh, how could you do without risk management? Um, uncertainty is inevitable. If you're in a business that's, that's stable and everything's running smoothly, then you're going to have hundreds of people wanting to come in and disrupt it and try and do it better. And that's, that's an uncertainty in itself. Um, and certainly the sort of businesses that I've worked in, um, oil and gas renewables, um, uh, nuclear power gen, those sorts of things. The, the uncertainty is is, is absolutely inherent, um, and, and you can see that historically. I mean, these businesses are very volatile. Um, so, I mean, the idea of trying to run a business like that without really getting hold of the uncertainties that are there, understanding them, understanding how they relate to each other, understanding how you can reduce the uncertainties by um, as a, through understanding, through information, where you should put your work to do that. Um, and also understanding how you can reduce the sort of potential negative consequences of these uncertainties. For me, I mean, that's the essence of, of running a business and how you could do that without risk management, I, I don't know. <laughs> I love it. So it's something that you, you cannot run a business if you don't have risk management in place. That's a good sales pitch to start with. Yeah, or, or actually just running a business is risk management. It's uncertainty management. That's what it is. Because if it isn't, if it's certain, if you know what's going to happen, then the, I mean, there's no fun to it at all. It's you, you, you'll, you'll very quickly optimize it. Everyone will very quickly optimize it. Uh, and then it just becomes a, a sitting duck for somebody who wants to come in and, you know, find that thing that breaks the whole thing up. So, you know, in, in Uncertainty is inevitable. It's, it's absolutely unavoidable. Exactly. Okay. So uncertainty is is inevitable. Therefore, risk management is vital. And if we didn't have any of it in place, then we would have no fun. Like it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so let's talk oil and gas. So you've obviously applied some of these techniques within the oil and gas sector. Can you um, maybe expand on that slightly? Yeah, so I mean, oil and gas is, is interesting. It's it's a big business. It, it's a lot of different things. Um, it's very often quite siloed the the way people run and manage uncertainty, manage risks in, in oil and gas. So I mean, obviously, safety is a huge part of this. Mm -hmm. um, safety and environment, and and just making sure that, that when you're producing, you you're looking after the people who are working for you, and and you're making sure that you do everything at all feasible to prevent the kind of disasters that can happen when you're you know, drilling three, kilo, three to five kilometer holes in the ground into very highly pressured uh, reservoirs. So, I mean, it's a, it's a risky business. So, you know, there's an immense amount of work done around trying to control those things. Um, 
there's also a lot of uh, compliance risk, bribery combustion, those sorts of things, um, cyber risk. I worked for Mesco, they had a big cyber attack a couple of years ago. So that was, uh, you know, we felt that physically on our on ourselves. Um, so, and, and all of these risks are managed by experts at managing those kinds of risks. And, and it tends to be, you know, it can be quite silent. Um, and, and that's fine. And I think actually for sort of major international oil companies that are so big, that they are essentially, I mean, two things. One is that they are essentially just a bellwether for the market. They're just following the market. If the oil price goes up, they do well. If the oil price goes down, they do badly, um, relatively speaking. Um, and, and, and they're so big that, that the sorts of, you know, a lot of these uncertainties, they sort of come out in the wash on a relatively short time scale. So the sort of portfolio effect uh, where, where some things are going well, some things are going badly, the irreducible risk, they're sort of cancelling each other out on a relatively short time scale. So you can see where you're going and you can sort of, insofar as you can adjust the course of something so big, you can adjust the course. Um, and in that, that circumstance, I think maybe the sort of holistic view on, on risk and return isn't quite so relevant. What I was trying to do in oil and gas, and what I'm still trying to do in oil and gas, is help smaller companies, not really small companies, not the sort of mum and papa companies that are making, doing sort of, um, you know, shale gas in, in North America. They're too small. I mean, they're just rolling a dice, and, and they know that. Everyone knows that. But sort of mid-cap companies, companies the size of mass that I was working for, um, big enough that there is a portfolio effect. It's not just rolling a dice, but not so big that they're just kind of, you know, sailing with the market. Um, and I think a company like that has has the agility to be able to outrun the market, maneuver within it. Um, but in order to be able to do that, um, and not just be in a situation where you're just rolling more die than than dice than 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 the papa company, in order to be able to do that, you really have to understand whether the investments you're making they're always risky. There's always a good chance that they won't work at all, and there's a chance that even if they do work, they won't work very well. Um, but basically what you're doing in oil and gas is you're, you're playing the game to try and find those, those big wins that, that cover all of that cost. Um, and what you really need to understand in that space is, um, are the, uh, is, is the return on the investment you're making here um, warranted by the risk that you're taking in making that investment? So it's really understanding that risk return metric. That's incredibly important. Um, and then sort of related to that is making sure that things will work on a portfolio level, maybe over a couple of years. I mean, maybe you won't, you know, you'll, there'll still be a lot of volatility year to year, um, but your shareholders probably aren't gonna let you go five years or 10 years before the big find. Um, so you need to be able to make sure that, um, that things are gonna work. You have that exposure to upside. You're also protecting the downside and keeping the lights on a year to year basis. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's that sort of mid cap piece that's very interesting. It's exploiting that agility. It's understanding the risk and return. And when I'm talking about risk here, it's not just the obvious ones, which are oil price and then the technical risk, how much resources there. Um, it's also, you know, around the places where you're working, uh, political security, um, you know, whether you can, you can live up to your standards with respect to sort of safety and environment in those places, uh, whether you can make projects work, whether you can make commercial agreements work, um, how things work in terms of contracts and tax and government take and all those sorts of things. So it's, it's, a, it's a broad picture, but it's trying to bring it all together to make sure that the investment portfolio you have, essentially what an oil company is doing is it's managing an investment portfolio with a lot of technical expertise, making sure that that is, that is working for you um, and, and makes sense in terms of risk and reward. Cool. So it's so the portfolio um, kind of diversity in a way is really important. So you have that flexibility, but also as well being able to see this over a, a time horizon as yeah. well, so yeah. that you can then kind of weather where you are getting peaks and troughs and things like the oil price, etc. Exactly. So with that, obviously there are there are some risks that can be quantified, or you can stick numbers on them where there, is, there are others that it's really difficult to put numbers on. How do you bring all of those together in a model? Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's a number of sort of components to that. Um, I think, I mean, the, 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 yeah, there's a different, the, the whole kind of risks are difficult to quantify, so we can't do quantitative risk management. Um, I mean, before I kind of defend that, I think just what I want to say, I think your point about diversification is very important. Point about portfolio is very important. That's why I do quantitative risk management. Is because you know if you're not doing that, it's very very difficult to put these aggregate these things together to a portfolio level in a meaningful way. Um, so that's what's driving it. And then then the question comes: Okay, well I can't quantify everything. Um, first, I'd say uh, you can quantify a lot more than you think you can. 
And I think a, a distinction people make is, um, uh, or it's a confusion that, that happens is people confuse something being difficult to quantify with something has a lot of uncertainty after you've quantified it. Okay. Um, and I think that's a very important decision because the problem is that when you when you quantify uncertainty, I mean, talked about my bookshelf. I think there's at least yeah, this one, uncertainty quantification. It's a, it's a discipline in itself. When you quantify uncertainty, you come up with a number that represents uncertainty, and people get very upset about that number because they go, "Oh, well, that's very exact that number." But what it is is an exact description of of how little you actually know. So it's very important to make this distinction. So, you know, there are situations where you can quantify quite well. Um, there's just a lot of uncertainty. Um, and, and I think uh, that's a very important distinction to make. But there are also things where either it's very difficult to, to, to quantify or there's no point in quantifying it. So there's a lot of risks that are essentially hygiene risks. They're, they're things you have to work on. Uh, you, you can't get around GDPR. You have to do that. You can't... Uh, you know, compliance, bribery, corruption, um, legislation, those sort of things. You have to manage those risks. Cyber risk, you have to manage those risks. So there's a bunch of stuff that you have to do just in order to be able to operate. And that's partly to do with license to operate, and partly to do with just simple common sense. There are things that maybe are in the DNA of your company. There are just risks that you will not be willing to take. There's, there's things that you won't to be happy unless you're doing everything you know humanly possible to avoid so those things since there's no point in quantifying those things because there's no decision there you're going to do them anyway so there's no point in quantifying them because you're just going to go ahead and do it then there's the sort of global structural things the sort of global economy and the rest of it now on a sort of shorter term yes absolutely that's that's a very central part of the kind of analysis that we're doing not so much trying to predict things like commodity prices but but trying to understand the range of movement and how things move together, um, so you can understand what what you know what the the range of outcomes is in the future. But in a sort of longer term, and if you're talking about sort of technological disruption um, and you're sort of about structural changes to the market you're working in, that's very difficult to quantify because that's very difficult to describe what it is. And there, I think yes, there you're more into sort of you know making yourself responsive, making yourself sufficiently agile, trying to understand how these things are going to affect you and how to to to, to steer the company to accommodate them. All that said, there's still an awful lot of things that people say are very difficult to quanti uh, to quantify, which I think are yes difficult to quantify, but are actually quantifiable um, and make a lot of sense to quantify. So things like brand, people say, well, I can't, I can't quantify how the devaluation of brand that is consequent on a, on a certain event taking place would affect me. And I think, mm, well, you can, because this sort of thing's happened a lot. And, and generally, I think if people are saying there is this consequence, this negative consequence, it's because it's happened before. And if it's happened before, you can go and look at it and you've got numbers around that, and it doesn't take very long to scrape data together to be able to, to, to make some sort of quantification of that consequence with its uncertainty range. And people will say, well, it could be all the way out here, it could be really, really terrible, or it could not make a difference. And there's, you know, Brand is a lovely one where, you know, uh, Volkswagen had that terrible case with the, with the emissions, and hardly made any difference to their to their to their business at all. Um, and that was a little bit bad, but I mean, it didn't make anything like this, the difference that people thought it was going to do. And then there are other things where people, you know, companies die on on the basis of relatively small events. So yes, there is a huge span there, but let's quantify that span and, and then let's see what it is. And then once you've made that quantification, then you can sort of dig into it and try and make it a little bit more um, refined. Um, political risks, stability. Um, terrorism, that's something we talk a lot, a lot about in some of the places that we're working. You know, the likelihood of these things happening, the consequences if they do, how you manage those things. And again, people say it was very difficult to quantify. But again, there's history, there's data. We can, we can quantify it. And the whole point of uh, uncertainty quantification, that kind of modeling, is to be able to understand um, how you deal with that uncertainty. Um, and, and so I think, you know, <coughs> Is a little bit of sort of multifaceted answer. There's the different kind of risks that require different levels of uh, quantification, but some of these things are easier to quantify than, than I think people give credit for. Okay, so then, so just to just to run this back at you, so there are some risks that you're always going to manage to as low as reasonably practicable yes. type things, and so they are almost non-negotiables within your organisation. So yep. actually, just get on and put those controls in place and make sure you've got them. Exactly. There are other things which are almost sort of those external factors, um, which again, you can, you can go back and you can look at the data that's going on within the market, et cetera, et cetera. Then when you come to those ones that are really pertinent in your space, it's almost saying, 
look, there's going to be a range of uncertainty here. So therefore, provided we are happy that the answer we've got is going to be wrong to a certain degree, and what the kind of the quality or the, the accuracy and the precision of that uncertainty is, then that should help then to you to make your answer in terms of how much effort you need to put in to control it. Yeah, I, yes, absolutely. I mean, the only, the only thing I think I'd sort of come back on there is, is, mm. is this idea that the answer is wrong because the answer isn't something you can test. The answer yeah. says there's this huge range. Mm. Uh, and and that's one of the I mean, that's one of the big challenges with uncertainty quantification is testing those those assessments because actually you need a lot of you need a lot of instances in order to have a sort of statistical basis for testing the inference. Um, but in a sense, it also doesn't matter that much mm -hmm. because what you're doing here is you're 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 always using these things to make decisions. Yeah. Um, and and very often what you'll find in those large uncertainty cases is that. Um, whether the uncertainty is, is this big, or and my hands are probably going out the screen now, is this big or, or this big, um, it, it doesn't actually make that much difference to the to the decision you're making. So that's something else that's very important is when you put these models together, that you recognize, you know, how accurate do you have to be on this? How right do you have to be on this? Um, mm -hmm. And then you can sort of satisfy yourself that actually, it's, yes, it's this big. And then, and then that sort of informs your decisions in a certain way. So it's just this sort of idea about, there's a lot of discomfort about people coming up with, with you know, precise numbers that are describing incredibly imprecise things yeah um and it's a little, i think it's kind of swimming in cold water you have to kind of dive in and and, and get used to it it's quite invigorating once you once you get there but <laughs> um uh it, it does take a little bit of getting used to that 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 way of thinking yeah and i guess i mean this is something as well where um certainly i've worked in organizations where people almost use continued analysis as an excuse not to make a decision <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. it's a case here of actually saying, well, no, actually those decisions will be time bound. So yes. the sheer yes. fact that actually your, your entire context is changing as it's moving through time. Yes. yes. And yes. You can't just sit there and not do <laughs> anything because no. that in itself is making a decision. Yeah. That, yeah. That I mean, it, in good cases, these, these methods can also help you uh, not necessarily sort of wait until the last minute to make the decision, but actually say, I am not going to get more information that's going to change this decision. It's called optimal stopping. It's saying, I've had enough, you know, I'm not moving this decision now, or at least maybe I can move the need a little bit, but I'm certainly not going to, you know, there's a, that information's not value to, valuable to me. You can make that decision and move on. Very often that's much more valuable than that tiny little, you know, extra refinement that you might get of just scraping together as much information as possible. Yeah, which, which I guess is a nice little segue into the world of exploration. Because I guess the, the biggest fear that a lot of people who work within exploration, be it in oil and gas or be it in mining or what have you, is um, you're, you're standing there on top of a potential opportunity. Uh, when do you know when to either walk away from it or to effectively pump more money into the ground and time and resources, et cetera? Um, so I guess this is my... Um, fairly ineloquent way of, of saying, okay, let's talk about exploration and, and how do, can we use risk management to really help us with those kind of risks in terms of, yeah. you know, when do you carry on, when do you walk away type thing. Yeah, yeah. So I think there's two components to that. There's, there's a sort of um, uh, political, social, commercial component to it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and that's very interesting because I think what you're doing there is you're, 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 you're asking about when, when do you, when you give up and, and, and when you keep paying. I think some of those questions is like, well, can we at all work here? Can we, can we get the terms to work? Can we get the commercial arrangements to work? Is this country gonna hang together for long enough for us to do this? These sort of, you know, can we, can we in any way help with that, support it, you know, support all of those things. <clears throat> and I think what you have there is a sort of principle of, and again, this is a place where, where these sort of quantitative methods can help you a lot. It's a sort of steady reduction of uncertainty. You go in and you negotiate and you, you, you gather information and you understand more and more about what's going on. Um, and essentially what you're doing there is your, your capital is following your confidence. As you reduce that uncertainty more and more, you're bringing more and more money in. But at some point, you're going to have to get to the point where you have to deal with the subsurface. Um, and, and these things are a long way underground. And, and I mean, it's astonishing. I'm, I'm not a geoscientist at all. My, my background is applied mathematics, but these, these geophysicists, it's absolutely amazing what they do. They, they have, you know, they, they set off explosions and then they listen for the reflections in the things. It's like having a really big sandwich and then, you know, tapping the top of it and listening to hear whether the third layer is ham or pastrami. 
Uh, it's quite incredible that they can get as much out of it as they can. But it's a long way down. It's very, very difficult. And it's hopelessly underdetermined. So you just don't know. And that's irreducible. I mean, you can you can do better seismic. You can do more seismic. You can do, you know, the earthy core. You maybe have some information around you. But you really have a very, very little information on what's going down there. And there's absolutely nothing you can do about that. The success rate for exploration wells is about 35%. It's a little bit higher recently because we've only been drilling the really sure things. Mm -hmm. um, but globally, the last 10 years or so, it's about 35%. It's not very good. I mean, it's one in three that doesn't come, uh, that, that comes through. Um, and, in, in, and when you're going out looking for sort of big resources, it's, it's even lower. Um, resources are nearly always disappointing. I mean, every now and then some monster comes through, but it's nearly always disappointing. So there is just that, that irreducible uncertainty. If you look at this on a prospect by prospect basis, there's absolutely nothing you can do about this. And this was what I was saying earlier about small companies who are just essentially you know, drilling sort of one at a time, rolling the die. They get lucky, they, they win huge. Mm -hmm. uh, and if they don't, then, then, then they lose what they've put in. Um, and that is unavoidable. What you can do is at a, you know, certainly in a sort of mid cap, but definitely at a, in, a, in a large company, is you're, you're diversifying those risks out um, by, by doing several of those things. And the game you're trying to play there is that you're looking for something that's big enough and that's going to pay for all the things that don't work. Uh, or it's or it's lucrative enough. It doesn't necessarily have to be big. It can be you know cheap to produce, or there's infrastructure in place, or whatever it is. Um, and that's why it's so very, very, very important that you are understanding those uncertainties and understanding that yes, within you know if I'm in over the course of you know three years, if I'm drilling thirty prospects, then I have a pretty comfortable chance of at least finding enough to keep the lights on, and then I have a respectable chance of finding something that's really going to make a difference to the company. Cool. So this, this is something here where I guess at the moment, a lot of organizations do this on gut feel. <laughs> yeah. Which, which yeah. I think, which I think would be fairly safe to say. Now there are of course numbers, there are different calculations that go on behind the scenes, you know, sort of what, what MPV are you looking at return on capital, all of that kind of, of stuff. And, and in the, in the article that you've written, you take us through actually, well, how can you put some slightly more robust numbers around that to actually try to understand the uncertainties as a whole? Um, would, that, would that be correct? It, no, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you say that companies choose on gut, and I mean, in some cases, I think companies would actually be better just, just, just <laughs> going with their gut and going, yeah, I like the look of that, let's go and do that. Um, <laughs> Because, because the mathematics of what they're doing isn't really making a lot of sense because they're ignoring the uncertainty. So what they do is they sort of say, well, there's this huge range of outcomes. Uh, if it goes kind of okay well, it'll look like this. And they try to find a sort of representative case that isn't the sort of high side case, which you're actually interested in, and isn't the failure case because that's boring, but it's something in the middle. And it's supposed to sort of illustrate and capture this full range of uncertainty. Uh, and then they sort of run economics on that. And then you go, yeah, that looks all right. And then, and then you go. And actually, I mean, that's miss. I mean, it's not a bad thing to do, but it's missing so much of what's potentially valuable in that decision making process. It's missing um, synergies between opportunities. Um, it's missing uh, this whole sort of diversification piece and this understanding of risk and return. Because, I mean, what you're doing there is you say, you know, what, what you really need to do is have that you need to look at that high side. If you're not looking at that high side, then you're not really understanding whether or not there is a possibility somewhere in that portfolio over the next three years of, of making that big win. So, I mean, there's, there's an awful lot you're missing out there. And, and, and to a certain extent, I think some of that analysis is, is a sort of, you know, little learning is a dangerous thing. It's kind of a little bit of a halfway house. You'd either be better just going, look, the geology looks really great. You know, I've got a good feeling about this. Let's do it. And then you're sort of using instinct and intuition and, and experience. Um, or you should be doing that uncertainty analysis properly. And obviously, I, I, I know which of those things I think is, is the longer term most successful way of doing it. Um, I think something that you have to recognize here is there is a lot of luck in this game as well. Um, an awful lot of luck. And even if you're doing all of this absolutely brilliantly, um you know you're still you're still rolling those dice yeah so and i think that that's really important isn't it because there is no there's no silver bullet to give you the answer to all of this stuff i guess all you're doing here is you're trying to use um a, a kind of almost decision making um support tool that is reproducible yes rather than what somebody an individual's gut and experience yes is perhaps yes is perhaps yeah. telling them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
And I mean, this is something where, I mean, I know that we've been talking about, about oil and gas, but of course, as, as you know, so my background's in mining and, and I'm one of those geologists that, um, that doesn't have nearly the mathematical prowess um, that you have. So, you know, obviously together we can bring, we can bring the guts or the rock licking um, experience with the mathematical side <laughs> together. Um, but this is something where, you know, from, from your knowledge of, of mining, what can mining learn from these techniques that have been deployed within oil and gas? You know, do you see it being able to be brought across into the world of mining? Yes. Um, I, I should just say right at the outset here, my knowledge of mining is very scant <laughs> and it's largely based on conversations we've had recently. So, um, so you, you must just jump in and correct me if, I, if I'm misunderstanding things. Um, one of the things I get very excited about when I, when I think about applying these techniques to mining is that when we do oil and gas, um, people say, oh, can't we hedge the risks out? And what that means is trying to say, okay, we're, we're doing something, you know, we have uncertainties that are negatively correlated. So if something goes well, something else goes badly, and something goes badly, other thing goes well. Um, and what's nice about that is that um, it, it, is, it essentially reduces your overall uncertainty. Um, it also reduces your overall return. It, it, it takes out that very big high side, but but a lot of com few companies are so big that they can just sit there and roll that die again and again and again. Um, so so anything that can reduce that volatility is a good thing. So hedging is nice. Now you can't hedge oil price. If you're an oil company, then you are just absolutely you just sat there you're getting spanked about by that oil price. Now I've been in the oil industry the last four years, and that oil price has been up and down and all over the place, and we spent an enormous amount of time trying to figure out what we're going to do with it. But from a sort of portfolio management point of view, it's actually very difficult to do anything about. There, there are things. Um, so one of the things we do is we make, try to make sure that we're in a, we have a sort of mixture of contracts where some contracts work well in low oil price regime and other contracts work well in a high oil price regime. Um, and then we try to make sure that we have the balance of that. So again, we have that sort of line of sight to upside of the oil price rallies for us, but we're protected. We're keeping the lights on if the oil price is, is dipping or crashing as it does occasionally. Um, What's really exciting is if you're in a business where you have several commodities um, and then you can you can play the, the hedging game. So if you have if you have commodities where, you know, you must correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong about this, sort of the, the economics of this. But I think if we're looking at sort of um, power storage, future power storage, and we're looking at lithium batteries versus hydrogen cells and then you've got lithium and you've got platinum. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so you're kind of thinking, okay, so you know, if it's if we go lithium, then lithium price is going to come up. Platinum is maybe not so in high demand, and then and then negatively correlated. Well, then we have a hedging opportunity, and that's great. That's really exciting. I'm not saying you should use it necessarily, but we can at least put that into the model and try and to understand how those things are working for you. And then there's a sort of collateral benefit. One of the things that just I get really excited about mathematically when I think about modeling these things is the idea of drilling after copper and finding gold. And that's just like, oh, that's really interesting because then, you know, that we can build into the model and we can understand how to do that. There's a whole sort of piece of relatively straightforward, but, but kind of fun modeling around, um, <clears throat> you know, what sort of facilities you'd have, you should have in place to be, um, uh, to be refining these, those things, value of flexibility, how much should we sort of leave open? Obviously, it costs money to leave things open, but then, you know, we... But, but it, whether or not we end up using them is, a, is, a, is an uncertainty that we can model and then we can make sort of sensible um, suggestions about whether or not it's worth doing. I should just say in all of this, um, when we do these models, they come up with answers, right? They come up and they say, you should drill this, 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 and this order. We never take them that seriously. Um, mm -hmm. Really what they are, I think, is, is a sort of quite rigorous effort to apply some logic, rigor, intelligence to the data you have, the understanding you have, um, the expertise you have, um, and to provide a framework where you sort of understand how things are relating to each other. Mm -hmm. um, so when we do an analysis like this, I think I say this in the article, it's not because we'll, we'll come out and we'll turn the handle and go, boom, that's what you need to drill. What we'll do is we'll say, okay, look, if you're going for, you know, if you're just you know, feeling lucky this year, this is what you're going for. There's a lady luck bank for the buck portfolio that just says, yeah, we're just gonna go after all the big stuff because this is our year. And then if you're sitting there going, oh, it's never going to happen, and you're feeling a bit down, then you say, okay, we're going to do these because this is the sort of best of the bad year uh, result. And then you'll have sort of stuff in the middle. Um, and what you'll do is you'll, you'll put those out and you'll say, okay, look, these are the different options. And very often what you'll have there in portfolio sense is you have a lot of stuff that's just good. 
whatever it, it works well whatever so you end up doing those and then you have that conversation and then and then all the other considerations come in about you know where you're working in the world synergies in certain areas capabilities is obviously a big part of the thing although certainly in oil and gas capabilities have long since been outsourced to to oil and service companies so it's not quite such a big thing as it used to be um and and and, and that's the conversation so so these methods aren't giving you answers yeah. they're helping your thinking and they're supporting the conversation great so so this is something as well where you can take this this methodology of being able to pull in all of those different factors ascertain what the level of uncertainty and risk might be with regards to all of those and so therefore then use it to help guide your decision making as to you know where you might like to pump in the exploration activity or, you know, for example, if you take this from an investment perspective, if I'm sitting there with an investment portfolio that I want or, you know, a pot of money that I want to invest, say, in mining or in oil and gas, for example, I might actually just then compare the different options that I'm looking at, but also be able to factor in those normal risks, shall we say, i.e. the kind of the technical side. So is there anything in the ground? Um, what is the country risk, etc. But then also bring in some of those less tangible risks as well, bearing in mind that there's just probably going to be a larger range of uncertainty with regards yeah. to this because they're just a bit more difficult to put your finger on. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and one of the things that that approach will do for you is it'll tell you where you need to really know and it will tell you where it doesn't. So, so for example, sort of brand reputation, yes, huge range of outcomes, probably won't spend an enormous amount of time really trying to get that right. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, the recognition that things can go really badly is enough in itself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, you can never get those that sort of likelihood down to the sort of level where you just can ignore it. So you've always got that possibility. And then the things that you're doing to, to, to mitigate that or to prevent it from happening, which is, you know, very much about sort of response, um, you, you know, how you respond to situations that are unfolding, crisis management, that sort of thing. Those things are going to be in there. You're going to do that. You're going to make those decisions. So the whole time you're sort of sitting there thinking, OK, this is my this is my view of the uncertainty. Um, if I can reduce this uncertainty and it can go one way or another, or I can be better at sort of capturing it, is that going to change what I decide to do at the end of the day? And the answer to that is no, then it's okay, fine, moving on. Let's focus our attention on things that actually really move the needle. Yeah, no, I, think, I think this is, I mean, it's really exciting because actually in terms of this form of risk management, which is obviously being used probably at the, the kind of the more senior levels of the organizations or with the investors, for example, is is actually it's following exactly the same sort of process as what you would do if you were working in, in the front line, deep underground or wherever the case might be. Because, you know, first you're trying to ascertain what is the context in which you're working and, and what is the objective you're trying to achieve. And then you're working out, okay, what are the potential opportunities and threats um, and how big might they be? What's the level of uncertainty? Then can we and do we want to do anything about them? which then takes you back up through a, you know, a bit of monitoring and review into, okay, given this context, is it actually possible to achieve those objectives? Or do we need to move some of those levers or move some of those goalposts, which yeah. I think is great because it then helps, it's the same decision-making process no matter where you are in the organization. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's moving the organization forward and empowering people to actually make the decisions at the right, at the right level, I guess. Yeah, you agree with that? Absolutely, absolutely. No, I completely agree with all of that. Um, I think the one, so, so I think, you know, when you're sort of thinking about quantitative methods specifically, maybe the one slight difference in that circle is, is the, the decisions and the management, I think, come early. Yeah. Um, you don't have to do it like that. And a lot of people don't. A lot of people will, will, will do context. They'll talk about objectives. They'll talk about what are the questions we're trying to answer with the model. A lot of people don't. They just pile into modeling, but that's <laughs> usually a waste of time um and then they'll do the modeling and then they'll say okay can, what, what what can we do about it now and what happens when you do that is you realize that a lot of the modeling you did wasn't really worth it because it's not actually changing any decisions you can't do anything about it um or you spend a lot of time reducing uncertainty or, or getting more data than you needed because it's not really changing anything so in that sense i think it's actually worth putting the decisions in in a little bit earlier in that cycle so that when you do that model, you always have an eye to, okay, what are the questions we're trying to answer here? What's actually moving the needle here? So you can you can make that data analysis uh, appropriate. But I think something else I really like about what you were just saying there is the scalability. Mm -hmm. So these kind of methods you could do on a kind of, you know, on an individual, um, individual facility, 
you know, looking at a sort of, you know, uh, um, you know even sort of maintenance or, or some sort of upgrade or something like that. And then, you know, do we need, do we want to have, you know, three or four trains here? And do we need to have sort of flexibility in the future and those sort of things? Um, we do a lot of value information studies where we're saying, okay, should should we do this now or should we go out and buy some more data or shoot some more seismic or something like that? So it can be sort of quite small scale individual things, or it can be looking at strategic options for an entire multinational company and, and then modeling those things um, and, and trying to make decisions on the basis of that. I think that scalability is, is very important. It's also very useful. But I think what you say about the, 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 the essential process, the essential workflow, is, mm. is absolutely, as you say, the same in those cases. And what's nice about the quantitative methods is that there's actually a possibility to to scale them up. So you can take a lot of these small decisions and then once you've built that model, it's actually not that difficult to sort of bring it up a level. You know, obviously you lose some of the detail when you take it up a level, you, you're sort of aggregating things and a lot of the detail gets lost in the wash. Um, but then you also have this relationship between the sort of individual decision on the ground decision and then the strategic decision in the company. That's, that's very satisfying when you can make that work. Yeah, no, I, I think really, really exciting. And as you say, so it's that, it's that scalability, but then also um, the awareness and the knowledge that it's, it's all iterative. Yes. So being able to go around that circle really fast. And every Absolutely. time you go around it, you're constantly checking, yeah, what was the decision again? Yeah. That's still the right decision yes. or the right yes. objective. Yes. Um, because you're always going to be learning new stuff and bringing that in. And I think a frustration for me has been when organizations say, we're only going to review our risks once every six months or something. Yes. <laughs> yes. And it's yes. Like, well, it's out of date as soon as you hit print on yeah. that yeah. report. Absolutely. Um, and, Absolutely. And the report is never you know, it's never entirely correct. Yeah. Well, there's lots of right answers in there, but you know, you need that, that variability or the uncertainty to be included. Yeah, definitely. definitely. So fantastic. So, so thank you so much um, for this just now, Graham. That's been absolutely brilliant. And, and I think um, really exciting to be able to learn maybe from um, some tools and techniques within oil and gas and think, okay, can we apply them to, to other sectors such as mining? And I'm sure as well, sectors such as pharmaceutical, agriculture, et cetera, et cetera. It's all the, it's all the same stuff. Um, ultimately, would you agree? Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, certainly from my perspective, it is. Um, yeah. People get quite cross with me when I say that. <laughs> say, well, you know, a uh, wind farm is not that different from an exit. It's a fairly, completely different thing. It's like, well, yes, they are completely different things. But at the level where I'm looking at it, you have a, a big upfront capital investment, a long lead time where you're not making any money, but you're spending an awful lot of money. Um, and then a lot of uncertainty about the, you know, both the rate at which you're paying it back and, and the, the um, um, yeah, yeah, so the rate in terms of, you know, how much a year and also how long you're going for and, 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 and you know, a lot of uncertainty you're trying to deal with. Um, you know, farmers are a very nice example. Uh, they have even more uncertainty than we do. They have even lower probabilities of success and, and much, much bigger wins when, when things come through. So, so and actually, a lot of the methods that we're using have been developed in, in farmers. So that's an obvious place. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, I think anything where you have inherent irreducible uncertainty that, that you that you need to sort of pull together to a sort of portfolio company level in order to be able to understand is absolutely just, you know, lying there waiting to be analyzed by these techniques. Um, but I think also, I mean, these techniques are, are very powerful at, at, for decision making at all levels in, a, in an organization. Yeah, no, fantastic. Cool. So thank you so much as well for the, the article that you've written, which of course provides some more um, how to and some great diagrams as well. So people who are visual can get their teeth or their eyes um, in, into that, as it were. But um, really looking forward to working with you more in the future, um, Dr. Keith, sir. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you very much. Likewise. Thank you very much.